So today we're in Matthew chapter 13. We're continuing a series found in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 13. We're continuing a series on the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we're going to do is we're going to be looking today at three parables that are found here in this particular chapter. We're going to be looking at the parable of the wheat and the tares. We're going to be looking at the mustard seed. And we're going to be looking at the parable of the leaven. And so I'll explain to you how we're going to approach this in just a moment. But let's begin reading together here in Matthew chapter 13 at verse 24. And I'll read from verse 24 to verse 35, give a prolonged introduction, move into our study, and we will be looking today at these three particular parables. So beginning at verse 24, Matthew chapter 13, Matthew writes, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Another parable he spoke to them, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till all was leavened. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled by which was spoken by that prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now I mentioned to you in our introduction that Matthew 13 records a series of eight parables that Jesus gave to the multitude that was following after him. And these parables related to what Jesus called the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 11 for just a moment and refresh your memory. Notice how it said, he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus Christ is referring to these as mysteries of the kingdom. Now, when you read your Bible in the New Testament, you'll see that the word mystery is used to refer to various revelations that God has given uh, a, a mystery is something that was at one time hidden that has now been revealed. That's the biblical use of the word mystery. And it has been revealed to those who have been initiated and instructed in the mystery. Initiated into the mystery would simply mean it is given to those who have been born again, who have the Holy Spirit who lives within them. They've been initiated in the sense that they've been saved, and then they've been instructed. You see, because before somebody comes to faith in Christ, the word of God to them is, is, is a, hidden, it's a hidden book. The Bible is a hidden book to those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. So someone can pick up the Bible and they can read it. It will make absolutely no sense because the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him and neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So the book, the Bible, is not like another book. It's like, not like a textbook. It's not like a novel, and it's not like a mystery that you might read concerning the various mysteries and, and all that we have authors who like to write concerning. The, the mystery that you find in Scripture is simply something that has been in the past hidden, but has now been revealed. And it is revealed to those who've been initiated and instructed in the ways of God. And so Jesus Christ is speaking concerning a mystery. When you're reading the New Testament, you're going to see that the word mystery is used to speak of a, a variety of things. Uh, it, it is used to refer to various revelations God has given. For example, you can see what is referred to as the mystery of the incarnation 
in 1 Timothy 3.16, where Paul said, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And so you have the mystery of the incarnation. You have the mystery of the indwelling Christ in Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have the mystery of the body of Christ revealed in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, where Paul said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife. The two shall be one flesh. This, he said, is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. You have the mystery of Israel's blindness in Romans eleven twenty five, 25, where Paul said, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. You have the mystery of the rapture. It's spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Those of you who have infants in, in our nursery may notice that we have the scripture where it says, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. That's in our nursery. <laughs> then we have the mystery of Antichrist found in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And so you have various mysteries that are mentioned in Scripture. And one of the mysteries that Jesus is speaking about is the kingdom of heaven. He also could be speaking of the creation of what we call or has been called the church. In Ephesians 3, 4 through 6, Paul said this. He says, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, the mystery of the church. You see, before God brought the church into existence, mankind was divided into two. They were divided into Jew and Gentile. But when the Lord brought forth the church, there are now basically three categories, and you see that in, in 1 Corinthians 10.32 when Paul speaks of Jews, Gentiles, and he goes on to say, and the church of God. The church of God is made up of both Jew and Gentile who are believers in Christ. And so the Gentiles have been brought into relationship with God through Jesus. And that's why in the New Testament, there are many Gentile churches that receive letters. And you read your New Testament, and you see that there's a letter to the Romans, a letter to the Corinthians, the Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and the Colossians. You see that there's a letter to the Thessalonians. You also see that letters were addressed to people who lived in Crete, in Laodicea, people who are from Hierapolis or per Pergamos, uh, from Thyatira, Cyrus, Philadelphia. These were all Gentile churches, and they were all part of this mystery that God has now revealed, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, which is the church. Now, the mystery is that God not only ministers to Israel, but also to Gentiles. And no longer would uh, believers have to travel to Jerusalem to go to the temple to offer sacrifices to God. You see, in Jerusalem, Jesus would be the sacrifice that resulted in people taking the gospel to the world. They used to go to Jerusalem to make offerings. They went to the temple but now the temple goes out to the world because Christ is in you and you take the message to those who have yet to hear. And God provided the sacrifice of his son. People became God's temple. People took out the gospel. So something new has happened. The church has been born. It is made up of Jew. It is made up of Gentile. The two have become the one new man. And so Matthew 13 covers what is called the church age, as well as events that occur after what is called the millennial reign of Christ, or the thousand-year reign of Christ. When we looked in verses 1 through 23 of chapter 13, remember with me that Jesus began to describe four kinds of responses that people would have to the message of the gospel. He was speaking of a sower who went out to sow his seed. Some fell by the wayside, some fell on stony ground, and some fell on thorns. And each one of those, in terms of their response to the word of God, could be called negative. They were unfruitful. 
But there is one ground that was called the good ground. It's this ground that is fruitful, and it's this ground that does the work of evangelism throughout the church age. And so, the following three parables reveal the ministry of the fruitful soil during the church age. Now, as we look at it, let me give you a background. Let me develop it with you a little bit of context. Because these parables reveal the visible church as a large but you're going to see that it is also revealing to us that the visible church may be large, but it is also infected. It's infected with unbelievers. These parables are very helpful for us to encourage us individually to evaluate if we truly know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's a good thing to evaluate whether Christ really is in you. You may have been raised in a church. You may have been raised in this church. You may have gone through various Sunday school classes, or perhaps the church tradition you were raised in would be similar to the one that I was raised in, where I had catechism classes, and, and I received various ordinances or sacraments of the church as a child, baptism, communion, confirmation. You may have gone through those sacraments to, to uh, matrimony and, and all of that. And, and that may be your, your religious heritage. And like me, you, you went to church and you were part of a visible body of people that were proclaiming themselves to be church. Well, this particular uh, series of parables will help all of us to evaluate whether or not, not we are actually, actually saved. And that's a good thing. That's something we ought to invite the Lord into. The psalmist in Psalm 26, verse 2, said it like this. He said, test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 1, said it like this. He said, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So there is a, a, a good and helpful thing for us to examine our own hearts. And, and that's what these parables help us to do. They help to take the mirror of the word, place it in front of us, so that we can see ourselves clearly and come to a conclusion as to whether or not we know the Lord. Now, in order to get a clearer understanding, I'm going to take these out of order. I'm going to first look at the parable of the mustard seed, then I'm going to look at the parable of the leaven, and that's going to help us to understand and contextualize the parable of the wheat and the tares. So beginning at verse 31 and verse 32, we'll begin with the parable of the mustard seed. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, is greater. it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. And so this is the parable of the mustard seed. The mustard seed was the smallest garden plant seed in Israel, not the smallest seed in the world. Now some have said the mustard seed is not smaller than the orchid seed. The orchid seed can be as fine as dust, and is smaller than the mustard seed. So there are those who have said that Jesus was wrong by referring to the mustard seed as least. Because in verse 32, he says that, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. And so they've said, see, he's wrong. Well, when you interpret scripture, the plain sense normally can be used to understand the meaning of the passage. Who was Jesus speaking to? He was speaking to Jewish farmers not an international group of botanists. Why would he use an illustration that did not connect with their world? It doesn't make any sense. Why would he say the orchid seed to a group of, uh, of uh, northern Israel uh, farmers? He wouldn't say that. He would say, this is what you carry in your bag of seeds. It's the smallest seed that you have. So we have to be careful right from the beginning because sometimes people want to reject the teachings of Christ for things that don't matter. And that's one of those things. Perhaps you've had an intellectual say that to you. Oh, Jesus said that the mustard seed is the smallest seed, but the orchid is much smaller, and thus he was wrong. Why would he use the orchid seed as an example 
when he's speaking to farmers who understand the size of a mustard seed. It doesn't make any sense. So we have to be very careful that when we use illustrations, perhaps I'm speaking to a teacher in here, you know this. When you use illustrations, you always use illustrations that can connect with the listener. You don't use illustrations that will not connect with them. I remember reading about a British, a British pastor who had come to the United States in order to, to teach, and he was in a church, and he said, I went to a baseball game, and he said, and the batter got a four-base hit. What is that? A four-base hit. So he's trying to connect with his audience, but we call it a homer, a home run. But he's, oh, no, it's a four-base hit. Well, you know, he, technically he's right, but that didn't make any sense to me. The bottom line is you have to be careful when you use illustrations to connect with the hearer. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's not going to speak of something that they're not familiar with. He's going to speak of something that is in general, something they all understand. And that's what he's doing here. He's speaking concerning a mustard seed, which they understood to be the smallest seed that they would plant. So he says it's, it's a seed that a man takes and sows in his field. His field would be where? In Israel. So he's sowing in his field in Israel. It's the least of the seeds of the crop that he would plant on his ground. But the point he's making isn't just that he was sowing the seed. The point to consider is how large the mustard seed grew and what happened. Now I want you to notice Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven being like a mustard seed. That helps us to understand he's speaking concerning the growth of the kingdom of God. Now, some would say that this speaks of the church starting out small and growing larger over time. And to some degree that would be true in that from a small group it grew larger over time. I was reading something by, put out by a, an organization called the Pew Research Center. It's based in Washington, D.C. And they gave an estimate of Christians, an estimate of Christians in the world, the number of Christians. And this is from 2010. And so the Pew Research Center says, as of 2010, Christianity was by far the world's largest religion with an estimated 2.2 billion adherents. Nearly a third, 31%, of all the 6.9 billion people on earth. And so that came out of a research center that is not a political and it's not a biased research center that's simply giving out facts, and that's what they said. It was the world's largest religion with an estimate, estimated 2.2 billion adherents. Now here's the question, how many in this room thinks there are really 2.2 billion evangelical believers? Who would really believe that? If that's the case, over 80% of Americans to this day still profess themselves to be Christians, which means that the 20% in prison must not be. So it doesn't make any sense now, does it? And this is what we're looking at today. So they would say, well, this is an... In uh, incredible growth of the church from the 11 faithful, the 120 in the upper room, uh, to now 2.2 billion people, they would say that speaks of incredible growth. But is that what the Lord is saying? Well, upon closer examination, you can get a different picture. And, and I'll show you this by just looking at uh, some of this as it relates to uh, what the Lord would be speaking about concerning this. Again, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed when a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, and when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs, it becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in it. Now, wait a minute. There's something that you use normally in interpretation of Scripture. It's just a study habit that you can get into, and it's called the law of first mention. The law of first mention. Now, the law of first mention, simply put, would be, how did Jesus use birds when he first introduced his parables. And we already know that. Look at verse 4 of the same chapter. As he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. The birds came and devoured them. Then you look at verse 19, and he interprets that by saying, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. Birds, the wicked one, are combined. And so you get a chance to see that the birds 
were used in the first parable and were depicted as evil. They devoured siege and they snatched away what was sown in hearts. So this doesn't speak of being good. This speaks of being evil. A second thing to point out is how Jesus said that it becomes greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. That gives to us some insight, and the insight would simply be, this is a picture of what has been called the visible church. Now let me develop that with you for a moment as we look at this introduction. Over the centuries, theologians have coined phrases used to refer to what we call the church. You have a phrase called the church universal. That speaks of the body of Christ throughout the world. The church triumphant speaks of believers who have died and gone to heaven. The church invisible speaks of genuine Christians who are recognized by God as the real deal. The church local speaks of individual congregations that meet in certain locations. And the church visible speaks of those who are the visible community of Christians. One thing about the visible church is that it is not always made up of genuine believers. Why? Well, church services always have the genuine believer and others who are there who aren't saved. Obviously, unsaved people are, are welcome normally to hear the message we desire to give them. They'll be present in the service, but they're not part of the invisible church. But the world will call them Christians because they go to church. And that's how it works in the world. So they'll say, well, that guy's a Christian. He went to church. Or that guy's a Christian because he was baptized. That guy's a Christian because of some outward emblem. You know and I know that Adolf Hitler was called a Christian. And there are people in the world who went through certain things, went to church services, and they were not believers at all. And so you have within the confines of the visible church, the real deal, and the person who's not saved. And that's the picture that we have here, those birds nesting in the tree, the tree representing the church, the birds representing evil, finding themselves to be at home in that mustard seed. So the church is described in this parable as being large but it is infected with birds. So evil is at home in the church. The church is large because it's infiltrated by unbelievers and the birds are nesting in the branches, they're at home, and the church has become infected with evil. That's the first. We'll look at the second and develop it a step further. Another parable, parable verse 33, he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Now, this parable reinforces what Jesus just said in the parable of the mustard seed. This would be a picture of the visible church permeated with sin. I want you to notice, verse 33, that the woman took and hid leaven. When it says she hid leaven, it, it speaks of yeast. Leaven is yeast. And she, she hid leaven in, in the dough, and it speaks of the leaven, and all of you who, who bake in here understand leaven, how that it permeates the entire thing. And so that's the point. It, this leaven has permeated the entire thing. So when you look in the Scripture and you see how is leaven used in Scripture, it's interesting to note that leaven is often a picture of sin. When the children of Israel were to, were to celebrate Passover, the children of Israel were to go through the house, and to this day they do this, to find any leaven. And they remove it with great ceremony. Leaven permeates. Leaven is a picture of sin. And in the New Testament, it continually was used in that same fashion. For example, when we look in Matthew chapter 16, in Matthew 16 verse 6, Jesus said, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In verse 12 of Matthew 16, they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In Luke 12, verse 1, Jesus said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And then Luke tells us that he says, Which is hypocrisy. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8, the Apostle Paul said it like this. He said, let us keep the feast, 
not with old leaven, neither with the leaven, and now he begins to describe leaven, the leaven of malice, which is ill will, a desire to injure somebody, the leaven of wickedness, which speaks of evil desires. He says, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So that's a picture of the visible church. It's a picture of the visible church over time being filled with sin. The visible church will gradually become permeated with hypocrisy, with bad doctrine, and a lack of biblical love. Numerically, it is large, but spiritually, it is permeated by sin and insincerity. So the question has to be asked, how is that possible? How could that ever occur? What happened over time? How did the church become filled with sin? How the church become a place that welcomes it in and is polluted? Well, that's what the parable of the wheat and tares answers. So in verse 24, we'll look at the parable of the wheat and tares. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? He said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles, burn them, but gather the wheat into my barns. In verse 36, Jesus sent the multitudes away and went into the house. His disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Then he goes on to say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. A man sows good seed in his field and an enemy sows what is called darnel. Darnel is a weed. It looks the same from the time it begins to, to grow until the very end. And then you'll see that the weed has uh, has no, no real crop, whereas the wheat produces kernels of wheat. But they look the same until they're in full maturity, and that's the point he's making. Now we see that the sower is Jesus. We see that the field is the world. We see that the good seeds are Christians, but the tares are unbelievers. So Jesus sows good seed in his field. His field is not just Israel. His field is the world. How does he sow good seed in his field? Well, he commissioned evan evangelists to preach the gospel in the world. That's what he'll do in Matthew 28 when he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so the, the seed of the word is intended to go not only in Jerusalem, but also in Judea, Samaria, and then into the uttermost parts of the earth. The gospel of Jesus Christ, in other words, was not intended to remain in Israel, but to go forth throughout the world. And so initially... The church is faithful to the commission, and the church preaches the gospel. And that's what you see when you look at the day of Pentecost all the way through the early history of the church. From, from the time that the church was birthed and filled with the Spirit, uh, believers would go out and proclaim this message, and the gospel has gone out throughout the world. The apostles and others took the message, gave it in a passionate fashion. Because they knew that people needed to hear the message of forgiveness. They needed to hear about salvation. They needed to hear of the coming judgment. Paul spoke about this in Romans 15, verses 20 and 21, when he said, I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. 
So he said, I went out and I took this message throughout the world. When you look at the Apostle Paul and you see the things that he did and the places that he went, he made sure that he was used by God wherever it was that he went to proclaim the gospel. And so the church initially was very faithful to the commission and preached the gospel very faithfully. So with that as your foundation, and we're going to be able to understand a little bit more about this parable as we look at this, with that as your foundation, how did error enter into the church and how does error come to be accepted as truth? How's that happen? Well, verse 25 supplies the answer. Notice verse 25. While men slept, an enemy, his enemy came, sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way while men slept. How did error enter into the church? And how did error infect? How did error make a church a place where those who don't know Jesus, how did error make that, and that people who don't know Jesus feel so comfortable amongst those who do, and never see a difference between the two. How's that happen? Men slept. Notice with me, the church is pictured as falling asleep on the job. The church is not on the alert. And while the church is sleeping, unbelievers are sown in amongst them. We, the church, have been called by God to awaken out of sleep. We have been called by God to watch and be ready. And every person here who's ever pulled any form of guard duty understands what that means, to be on watch. I, in the military, they would place us on what was called watch. And we would watch. I was in Fort Benning, Georgia in 1971. And I had to guard this particular house. A friend of mine and I had to go around the house. We were on guard duty. And in the house was a man named Lieutenant Kelly, a man who was being charged with the Milai massacre. And I went around that with others, and it was our job to pull guard. That's what they called it. We were to be on the alert. We were to be on watch. Combat vets know that even deeper. Combat vets know that you will be placed in a position of watching in case the enemy should enter in. And you are to be alert because he can come in a stealthy way, infiltrate, and take the lives of your friends. The Bible teaches us that we're not to be asleep, but we're to be awake. And yet Jesus says here that they slept while men slept. So how could non-Christians ever be comfortable in a church? How could sons of the wicked one ever pass as sons of the kingdom? The answer is very simple. The church will cease being known for holiness. The church will cease being known for the love of God. The church will cease being known for rejecting evil. And the church can become and can look like any other organization in its day. There are numbers of places called church that are more of a cultural center more of an infotainment center, more of an entertainment center, more of a variety of things than a church. And people come, they sit in there, they never hear a Bible study, they're never convicted, and the church is infiltrated. It begins with the pulpits being occupied by men who don't value God's word. When the minister of the word of God doesn't esteem the gospel, then it will not be faithfully preached. And when the gospel is not faithfully taught, people will not live according to the standards of God. You see that in Malachi, when the Lord is speaking to the priests of Israel. The prophet Malachi first delivers a strong rebuke to the priests for despising God's name. They had failed to teach the people God's commandments. They were offering polluted sacrifices to God. The, the priest didn't honor him, nor did the priest reverence him. As a matter of fact, when you read Malachi, and we're doing that, as I mentioned, on, on Wednesday nights, when, when, you, when you read Malachi, you see in Malachi chapter 1, verse 13, 
that, that they, were, they were actually tired of serving him and they were offering inferior sacrifices to him. And, uh, and we read it when it says, you say it's too hard to serve the Lord and you turn up your noses at his command, says the Lord Almighty. Think of it. Animals that are stolen and mutilated, crippled and sick, presented as offerings. Should I accept from you such offerings as these, asked the Lord? You see, pastors and teachers need to value God's word. And pastor teachers need to properly present the word of God to people. Paul said it like this in Philippians 1.17. He said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. The word set means I have been strategically positioned for this, to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has placed me in that position. And when he was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.20, he said to this young pastor, O oh, Timothy, guard that which was committed to your trust. Guard it. It's been committed to your trust. It has been handed to you and guard it. You see, the result of not teaching is people can go to church services and not ever think of bringing a Bible. Why would they? It's not even opened up during a church service. One of the things that I'd like to guarantee is that you will always need a Bible here. We will always go through the Word of God. We need to teach through the Word of God and understand it. But you see, many will not tolerate anything that goes against what they already believe. Anybody correcting, anybody contradicting their beliefs will be ignored. They'll be rejected, they'll be disliked, and they will be spoken against. In Jeremiah 5.31, it says, The prophets prophesy lies, the priests rule by their own authority, and my people love it this way. But what will you do in the end? In 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, Paul, speaking of the last time, says it like this. He said, the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. They will. And that's what's taken place even today. Because the Bible is not taught, false teachers infiltrate the church and they introduce error. People will be deceived Discernment concerning truth and error does not exist, and the result is that false teachers will be given prominent places in the church world. That's happened now. You're seeing it today. If you're aware of what's taking place in the church, I know of a church that uh, has, they advertise uh, their baptisms, so people show up for their baptism, they have a bar and beer there so that you can drink some beer and watch the baptism. A friend of mine was just speaking to me just this last week. He said, you know, in my area here, and it's in Orange County, he says, in my area here, we have out here a church that's advertising beer and Bible. Now, there are a lot of guys, you're, you're going to ask me where that church is, aren't you? <laughs> beer and Bible. How do you do that? How do you get to the place where one of the most significant acts of a Christian, which is to... to to acknowledge that I am dead in Christ and yet I'm alive. I go in the water to demonstrate that I'm dead and buried. I come out of that water to represent newness of life. I am in Christ and I walk by the grace of God. And oh, by the way, can you save a beer for me later on? How's that work? It's when you don't value the things that God values. That's how that works. When you don't teach the word of God and encourage people to live for Jesus Christ, that's how that works. It's deception. Now, it's important to note that, that this was a matter of grave concern to Jesus as, as well as the apostles. When you read Matthew chapter 24, and we'll go there. Let's see, we're in chapter 13 now. We'll go there in two years. And when you get to Matthew 24, you're going to see in verses 4, verse 11, and verse 24, that when the apostles are asking Christ concerning the signs of the end and all, what's going to happen? Jesus, no less than three times says, take heed that you're not deceived. The number one thing, and this is interesting because we have so many today who are real good at, at pointing out the amount of earthquakes that we have, the pestilence that we have, and so many things that are taking place that help to highlight the reality that we're living in the last days. And they forget to mention that the first thing that Jesus said, and he was asked concerning the sign of your coming, not the signs, the sign of your coming. What is the sign of your coming? And the answer is deception. That's the answer. And everything else highlights the conditions of that age, but he's saying it is deception. 
That's how you end up going to a church that offers beer and Bible. That's how you end up going to a church that has baptism in beer. That's how you end up in a church that has thousands of people that are listening to doctrine that is not true and cheering almost every word of the sermon. My wife and I were watching uh, TV yesterday, and there is a particular group of people with a pastor who is preaching. It's a very large group of people influencing the whole world. And the pastor is giving a message. And I told Marie, I want to hear a little bit of what he's saying. And when they do these, these uh, pullaways and show the size of the amount of people that are showing up there, there are multiple, multiple thousands of people, and he has more than one service. It's really a great, a great amount of people showing up. And, and, and so I, I'm watching this, and he's quote-unquote teaching and all, and, and he quotes out of a, 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 a portion of Scripture, as a man thinks in his heart, so is the man. And he begins to say that all the blessings that occur in a person's life are what proceed out of him as he thinks that's what he is. And I turned to Marie and I said, no, and I, I put it on pause and I said, Bible study time. I said, time to look at that, honey. Give me the Bible. And we open up to the passage and I said, now let's read the context and see whether or not that's what God is saying. And the context does not dictate the teaching. I said, that's the way that they put error into the minds of people. They don't give you context. They, they just hunt and peck. It's called eisegesis. It's reading into the text. And what he's doing is reading in. And I said, and I can tell you that he got that teaching not from the Bible. He didn't get that from the writer of Proverbs or Psalms. What he got that from is he got that from one of the teachers who got that from a teacher who got that from a teacher but that teacher that initially brought that in was wrong because that's not what that scripture says and yet the people are cheering because he's saying that all the good things that occur in your life is because of how you're thinking and that's how error enters in because there's no proof text there's no how's this work where was this found in scripture? Are you saying I create my destiny? I'm the one who determines these things by the words of my mouth, and yet that's what you have. And thousands of people buy into that. You know why? I'll tell you why. Listen carefully. It's because this book here that we call the Bible is on shelves all week except Sunday and only read when that person reads to us and explains. That's why because we're not having devotions, because not, we're not on our knees, because they're not saying, God, help me. Oh, I'm not a pastor. I'm just a sheep. I don't have to do that. Yes, you do. That's how you guard yourself from error. Take heed, Jesus said, that no one deceives you. He didn't say just that to the pastor. He said that to us. Take heed that no one deceives you. And see what happens in the church in the latter days. It is infiltrated with evil. It has leaven. There are people who don't know the Lord who are settling in. There are birds that are very much at home nesting in the branches because they're never ever given any reason to not be comfortable because the Bible is not being taught. You see, the Apostle Paul warned the elders of the church of Ephesus concerning the invasion of deceit. He said in Acts 20 verses 29 and 30, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. You see, the natural inclination of the human heart is to reject what is not to their taste. We do that. If it doesn't taste what we want it to taste like, we reject it. Story time. My mom made friends with a woman by the name of Ruthie Frankenbendera. My brother and I were around four years old. My brother was around six years old. Mama took us to the, uh, the Sears in Los Angeles, which was the only Sears at that time that I can remember. And we were in, she was in Sears with us getting something and took us to the, to the bathroom because we had to go to the bathroom. And, and in the bathroom was a woman named Ruthie Frankenbendera. Around my mom's age, she had two kids that were close to my brother Frank and my age. And so my mom was speaking to her in the bathroom and Ruthie became a good friend of my mom. Italian woman from New Jersey, had a real thick accent, and, I, and she was very, very dear to my mom. Very dear. Italian. Her husband was Italian. Frankie Frankenbendera. How, how much more Italian can you get than that? 
Frankie, Frankie, Frankie. Anyway, I loved Frankie and Ruthie. Beautiful people. And so my mom takes us to Ruthie and Frankie's with my dad and, and my brother, and off we go to their house. And Ruthie, this, this, this hardcore Italian woman, makes a spaghetti, spaghetti. And she brings it and puts it in front of us. And I'm looking at this, and I'm smelling that cheese. Mama, that smells like dirty feet. <laughs> you be quiet. You eat your spaghetti. No, I'm, I'm going to do that. I would not eat it. I wouldn't eat it. I still remember. It's a long time ago. I still remember. I would not eat real Italian spaghetti. It's the marinara sauce and all the cheese. No. I wouldn't do it. Why? Because that was not like my mom's. Mexican. <laughs> but what was Mexican spaghetti? Sopa de fideo. <laughs> and tomato sauce. That was our spaghetti. I am not kidding. We didn't have stinky feet cheese on it. And mama would cut up some meat and throw it in. You know, and that was it. And so I developed a taste for my mama's spaghetti. Then I rejected the real thing. The real thing. Now, I have to be honest with you, I've grown up. <laughs> I love Italian food. I'll be going to eat it tonight. I love Italian food. But when I first was introduced to it, I had been fed a diet of something other. And when I first tasted it, I said, I reject this. Guess what? That's what happens when you haven't been taught the word. You hear a Bible study and you go, no, that's not true. No, that's not true. I have a friend of mine. His name is Ron Arbach. I was teaching a long time ago back in the day that we were in Ontario. I quoted a particular teacher and I said, this man teaches false doctrine. And I didn't know it, but Ron was part of that Bible study because he normally went to this guy's church. And the next week, apparently, I, for some other reason, I quoted the guy, I gave the reference where you could find his material, and this is what he said, and I said, this is the error. Well, I didn't know that Ron was there. I was teaching a, a class at the Bible College in Twin Peaks. Ron walks up to me and he says, Pastor, I want you to know I go to your church. And I said, oh, really? He said, my name is Ron. He began to share his heart with me, lived in, in Pomona and all. He says, and, and I'm now going to the Bible college, he says, because I, I would like to be a, a pastor. But I want to tell you that the first time I came to church with you, you quoted my pastor, and I got angry at you. I said, how dare he say something about my pastor? He said, and so I went home, and he says, I have every one of the tapes that you mentioned. He says, I have them all, and I've listened to them. And he said, and I pulled out that, that you referenced. You told me what it was. He said, I knew I had it. I listened to it. And he goes, and I thought, he quoted him in context. That's, that's what he said. He said, so I thought I'll give you another, another chance. He said, I went back the next week, and you did it again. And I got mad a second time. And I went back, he said, and I opened up that box that I have all those tapes, and I put it in. Tapes. CDs, used to be four track, used to be eight track, anyway. So, used to have things that were vinyl that spun around, anyway, tapes. And he said, I listened to that one again. And you quoted it correctly. He said, he said, pastor, he said, I was upset when I heard that because I thought that you were judging my pastor. He said, I discovered you were simply quoting him and you were pointing us to truth. Now, Ron is the pastor of Calvary Chapel, San Antonio, Texas. He's got a great work going there. But when he first came, he got insulted and angry because the word wasn't up to his taste because he was used to things that were said in a certain way. And sometimes people will go to church because they're not getting a systematic study, and they end up just whatever that pastor wants to point out today. That's what I like. I'm a 
it's appealing. He's got a great personality. He smiles. He laughs. He has us hold our Bible up and say, this is my Bible. I believe everything in it. it must be true. He never opens it up again during the service, but at least we said our oath. That's what you have. How is it that evil can find a home in the church? No teaching. Appealing to the ear. People having itching ears. They will voluntarily turn themselves from the truth and turn unto myths. Isaiah 30, verses 9 and 10. This is a rebellious people. Lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seer, do not see, to the prophet, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Because sin is ignored, people will come to church and comfortably be seated as tares among the wheat. They consider themselves Christian, but in reality, they don't know Jesus. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, Paul said, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with them. That's the Bible. Having a form of godliness. So what are the first two things he speaks about? The first two things, lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Those two things have found themselves into what we as Americans take for granted. Listen, my dad, when I was growing up, said to me, son, take care of your health, because if you take care of your health, it enables you to have wealth, health and wealth, health and wealth. He didn't say it quite like that. He said, take care of your health, because if you don't have good health, you can't work. If you can't work, how are you going to produce income for your family? Health and wealth. That's America. That's what we're raised. That's how we're trained. We go to college so that we can have wealth. We diet and exercise, those who do. I look back in the past and say, I used to. I don't care anymore. But what we do is we work out so that we have health. We take our vitamins and we do all those things. so that we. And it's, it's not that that's evil it's in and of itself. I'm not saying it is. And please don't mis misunderstand. What I'm saying is, is it can become the more important thing than loving God and loving others. In my own finances, my own physical, I have to die to self and I have to be generous. To de it, it demonstrates that I have a relationship with God. But when it's all about me, when it's all about me and what I have, then it's backwards. And, and Paul says that's what's going to take place. They're going to be lovers of themselves and lovers of money. And so there's going to be a willful, deliberate rejection of the truth and, and, and as, as a result, the teachings of the scriptures will uh, no longer find a home in the heart of those who should believe. It's like what it says in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Well, as Jesus is speaking, Notice what they say in the second portion of verse 28 to verse 30. Do you want us to go out and you want us to gather them up? And the Lord says, no. You see, it's always been a temptation to use our own efforts to clean up the church. Some established man-made regulations, they want to keep the appearance of holiness. You can't always judge by appearances. You can't. Some wheat is slow-growing. Somebody gets saved and they come from a rough background and they're seated next to you in church and you look at them and they don't look like what we think Christians are supposed to look like and, and you feel all awkward next to them and everything. That guy can't be saved. He doesn't look saved. Whatever that means. He doesn't look saved. 
And so we have this appearance. And so what we do is we make rules and regulations. And we say, well, listen, if you're going to be a member of this club, you need to look like this and do this. And, and before you know it, we start stifling the work that God wants to do. We have to be very careful to impart the word and trust the spirit and, and a lot of grace and, and watch what God can do in somebody's life. Because God has a way of cleaning up the fish after he caught it. But a lot of people like to clean up the fish, at least they're more comfortable around that clean fish, even though that fish doesn't know the Lord. And so... What we do is we establish rules and regulations. We try to keep it looking holy. And we need to remember, Jesus says, let them grow up. Because it's, in, it's not in the growing up, it's in the full maturity that you see where the fruit really is. The darnel does not produce wheat. Wheat does. And it's not your job to go and clean up the church. The Lord has a tendency of doing that, and he does it well. He speaks concerning the fact that, uh, verse 39, the enemy who sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the age, reapers are the angels. So the church isn't the reaper, the angels are. As the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, they'll gather, up, gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. Those who practice lawlessness will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing, gnashing of teeth, the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The day of judgment is coming. And those who don't know the Lord will be judged. It's interesting how the scripture makes it very clear. Like it says in verse 43, the righteous will shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. That reminds me of Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, where it said, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. Those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Some will be reaped and they will enter into judgment. Others are reaped and they are receiving glory. And when Jesus speaks of this final judgment, notice verse 42. It says he'll cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. You need to keep that in mind. I remember a guy who at one time was in this church, he has since died, but he was in this church and he said, I don't mind going to hell because that's where all my friends are going to be and we'll party. That's not how Jesus described the final judgment. It's not a party. It's wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's pain and separation. It's an absence of love. It's an absence of joy. It's an absence of peace. It's an absence of God. Judgment. But then there are the others who are wise, and they shine like stars. In Revelation 20, 11 through 15, John said, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence. There was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what he had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. He was thrown into the lake of fire. And it doesn't end. Judgment is eternal, even as the life in Christ is eternal. You continue. The difference is, in Christ, we have life. In the enemy, it's only death. What you have in eternity is a continuation of existence if you're unsaved. What you have in Christ is a continuation of life, and that more abundantly. There's a difference. There's a difference between existing and living. In Christ, you're alive. And you need to make sure that you are you are in Christ. And finally, he says this, and we'll close with these words. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Salvation does not occur because you hear. Salvation occurs when you hear, receive, and ultimately, your hearing and receiving is evidenced by your doing. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? 
there's nothing wrong with examining your own heart. If you are relying on being in church today, or if you're relying on being raised in the church, if you're relying on anything outside of Jesus Christ, you're a tear. You're a tear. You are comfortably in a, in a church, but you're not in Christ. And Jesus warned us about that. The church visible will increase numerically but within it will be evil. Birds finding a home there. And what we do is we examine our own hearts. Christ, are you really in me? Am I really born again? And if I am, is there enough evidence that I'm in you that if I were taken to trial in a court of law, people would point to that evidence and I'd be convicted as one of your followers? Is that true in my life? And that is a question only you can answer.